Is this audible at this height? Okay, perfect. <laughs> um, can be an issue. Uh, thanks, Robert. Um, right, so today I'm going to give you a biased tour of the Uncertainty Visualization Zoo. Uh, so, as Robert said, I've been uh, spending time over the past several years trying to understand how to communicate uncertainty to non-experts. Um, I've also recently had some students who've started uh, categorizing and, and collecting uncertainty visualizations, both from research and uh, from the news. And so this actually makes it a perfect time to be invited to give a talk, to give a tour of the Uncertainty Visualization Zoo, because we've been collecting a lot of specimens. Um, but what I'd like to start with is this question, uh, which is what happens when we ignore uncertainty? Um, this is one of my favorite examples of an uncertainty uh, visualization. Uh, this is from a scientific paper. This is actually from recommendations for how scientific papers should be written. Um, a mixed design ANOVA with sex of face as a within subjects factor and self-rated attractiveness and oral contraceptive use as between subjects factors revealed a main effect of sex of face, F of 1, 12, 76 equals 1372, P of less than Point zero zero, no thanks. Um, so an alternative to this might be something like a regression coefficient table. Uh, I'll, you know, you, you have essentially the same information there. The standard error is in brackets, and there's probably some asterisks for p-values, although that's really not very great either. Uh, so you might line up all of your coefficients and do a coefficient plot and slap some confidence intervals on there. Uh, essentially, the same information is being communicated by these two presentations. You may even go a little bit further and do something like uh, add a likelihood or a Bayesian possibility exterior on top of that. So that's trying to give you a sense, a, a greater sense of uh, the fidelity or a greater uh, fidelity in, in the sense of what the uncertainty in that estimate is, though. Uh, you still might ask the question, how easy is it to ignore the uncertainty? And I, I would argue very, so I could look at that uh, number or that dot or that other dot and simply take those as the estimates and ignore the uncertainty. Um, this contributes to what uh, statistician Frank Harrell likes to call dichotomania. Um, the unending ability of human beings to dichotomize things and ignore uncertainty. Uh, so what happens is I take all of these intervals, uh, well, I won't try a laser pointer, or I can do it up here. Ah. Uh, I'll take all of these intervals that didn't overlap zero, um, and I'll publish those, and I won't publish that one, and then we get publication bias. Uh, so this is a problem. Um, we talked a little bit about elections yesterday, and I think one of my favorite examples of dichotomania comes from elections. So these are probabilistic predictions of Trump's chance of winning the election uh, for in 2016 from three different poll aggregators. So 538 gave him a 28% chance, uh, the Upshot gave him a 15% chance, and Huffington Post gave him a 2% chance. Um, a lot of people got angry at... Uh, these poll aggregators, um, because they were surprised, uh, and also for other reasons, ob obviously, but uh, I think surprise was a component of it. Um, and part of that is that you see that 28% and you're quite content to round it down to zero. Um, so let me show you something else. Uh, this is called a risk communication theater. The idea here is I give you a ticket to a random seat in this theater. The seats are colored black in proportion to the chance of Trump's winning the election. Um, I hope you might agree with me that you would be a little less surprised to end up in a black seat here than when I just told you the chance was 28%. Um, so I think the lesson to take from this is that people are very good at ignoring uncertainty, but this is especially true when we provide bad uncertainty representations. Uh, and so I, I, I really liked uh, what Mona was talking about yesterday with respect to uncertainty in that we can't just provide whatever uncertainty representation we like and hope that our users figure out how to do it. There are ways that humans are good at interpreting uncertainty and we can use them and then people will be good at interpreting uncertainty. Um, so risk communication theaters are not a uh, necessarily new idea. They're essentially icon arrays, which is a, an idea for medical risk communication. Um, the idea here is that I give you a grid of, say, 100 or 1,000 um, 
people representing potential outcomes and color them in proportion to different possible outcomes. So here I'm trying to make a decision between two different treatments for angina and it's uh, coloring by success. But the nice thing about this is people aren't very good at in, uh, reasoning about uh, conditional probability uh, when you present conditional probability as proportions. But if I were to start coloring these by, uh, say, other things that might happen in some of these groups, uh, like complications, you can more easily reason about what's the chance of some complication within some group. Um, this is called a frequency framing or a discrete outcome visualization of uncertainty. Uh, and there's a lot of growing evidence that this is kind of the direction for uncertainty visualization to be effective. Um, so that's all well and good. I mean, that's a fairly simple example, though. That's uh, basically a categorical distribution. Um, What's an icon array for a continuous distribution? If you have a continuous variable, how do you do this sort of thing? Uh, so this is something that I was kind of interested in. Um, I'll give you a motivating scenario from some of my work. Uh, I did my PhD in Seattle. So this is a uh, system called One Bus Away, where they track all the buses in Seattle in real time, try to predict when they're going to show up at the bus stop. Um, so this display here is telling me the bus number 120 is uh, going to show up 11 minutes from now. There's a six-minute delay, uh, which you might be able to see right there. Um, technically speaking, there is an uncertainty uh, visualization here. If you read down at the bottom, it says bus arrival estimates are based on the best available information, but actual times will vary. <laughs> um, so I might be standing at a bus stop, and I might ask myself, well, there's a Starbucks across the street. Um, there's a local coffee shop that has actually good coffee sitting right beside it. Um, do I have time to get a coffee before I catch that 11 minute bus? Well, what the system is telling you right now is something like this. Uh, so sometime between zero and infinity, um, your bus is going to show up 11 minutes from now. Uh, <laughs> this is not very helpful to me. Uh, what I probably want is something like this. So here's a uh, probability distribution of my expected time to arrive of my bus. Um, but, I mean, really what I, what I kind of want out of this is something like this. So uh, there's a 90% chance that my bus comes eight minutes from now or later. Um, although now I have a couple of problems with this. One of them is that that 90% is going to change from person to person and situation to situation. Um, so I can't just give you this uh, one-sided interval prediction that your bus is going to show up uh, with 90% likelihood eight minutes from now or later. Um, because maybe I'm going to a really important meeting where I definitely need to be on that bus, or maybe I'm just going to get coffee uh, with some friends and I don't actually care if I, if I am a little bit late. Um, so my risk changes, my risk tolerance changes depending on my own situations. And then you have different people with different risk tolerances. So you can't just simplify this thing down to a single interval that's going to work for everyone. Uh, the other problem with this is, as we all know as visualization folks, People are, if, if I were to just say, OK, well, the solution to this is I'm just going to give you this density. Um, well, we all know that everyone's terrible at uh, area perception, right? Um, so you'll probably get this right, but not because you actually um, can see the answer. Uh, how large is this circle as a proportion? Uh, how, how large is the small circle as a proportion of the large circle? Anyone want to guess? Guess with your eyes and not with your brains, because you probably know the answer. 80? Yeah. yeah, so it looks like about 80. It is, as you probably would have guessed, 50. Um, so area perception is terrible. Uh, so um, yeah, so, so most people guess 80, unless you have done some study, looked at studies of visualization perception, and then you might guess, ah, I'm trying to trick you. It's actually 50. It is 50. Um, right, so this is probably not a great uh, presentation. Um, let me give you a different approach. Uh, so I'm going to take the integral of this. So this is the cumulative distribution function. It's telling me um, at any, any given point along here, uh, What's the probability, what's the area under the curve to the left of that point on the lower axis? 
Um, although I'm not going to try to describe cumulative distribution functions to end users. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to take a bunch of evenly spaced points in probability space, um, project them back into minutes, and then stack them up into a dot plot. Um, and what happens when you do this is exactly that type of counting that works in an icon array now works for interval estimation. So if I count up these 20 hypothetical buses that I've put here, I will notice that I'll miss two of them and get 18 of them if I show up eight minutes uh, along that timeline, which means I have a 90% chance of getting the bus if I show up uh, eight minutes from now. So that's all well and good. Um, you can fairly efficiently extract this. In fact, you don't have to count if the number of dots are low. Uh, so there's this thing that we can do called subitizing, uh, which is if you've ever looked at a playing card that has like three hearts on it, you don't actually count the three hearts. Uh, you recognize that there are three there. Um, that works up to about five. Um, and so if you're using something with a denominator of around 20 and most of the, the intervals you care about are in the tails of the distribution, um, most of the things that you're going to use to do the estimation is not counting, it's supertizing. So that's nice because it's fast and it's accurate. Um, and that's actually what we found. So we've done some uh, experiments looking at uh, the error in people's estimates using different approaches. Uh, one of the cool things that we found is, as you would expect if people are actually using supertizing, um, with low density dot plots, error goes down. With high density dot plots, people essentially use area estimation and become about as bad as densities. But the real problem, the other, well, what I should say is the other problem with uncertainty visualization is even if you can demonstrate that people can get the probability out of a representation that they should need in order to make the best decision, that doesn't mean that they know how to use it to make that decision. Um, so we have this other question, which is do better uh, estimates perceptually actually lead to better decisions? Um, and I can't make a general statement about this, but we have run incentivized experiments on this sort of thing to try to answer that question. So we did a follow-up experiment where we were looking at, uh, we were essentially putting people in fake bus catching scenarios and giving them incentives like, I'll pay you a couple cents per minute for uh, every minute you hang around at home because you like watching TV. I'll take a couple cents per minute off of your payment for every minute you hang around at the bus stop because that's boring, or in some scenarios we'll say that it's raining. Uh, and then we'll give you a bonus if you get to your meeting on time. And then you can do interesting things like take the decisions that people make, uh, calculate the uh, optimal decision using uh, expected value, and then just take the ratio of those. So the greater that is to one, the better decisions people are making. And what you see when you do that is that in this particular case with dot plots, better estimates actually do lead to better decisions. And over time, uh, so the x-axis here is just trials, people learn to use these representations uh, even better. Uh, so these intervals here are uh, predictive intervals. So uh, based on the data and the model we fit to it, we expect 95% of new observations to fall, uh, for example, in that region. You compare that to densities, densities do not do too well. People don't learn very well, and you still get a lot of people down around 60% uh, or 70% of optimal. Um, so the nice thing about these types of representations, I think the other thing that's important to recognize here is um, the variance is going down as well as the mean going up, which means that we're raising everyone, right? So it's, it's, a, it's a type of uncertainty representation that doesn't just work for experts, but actually helps everyone do better. And that's the kind of thing that you want. Okay. So... Before I kind of continue this tour of the uncertainty zoo, I've kind of played a little bit of a trick, which I haven't really told you what uncertainty is. <laughs> um, so I'm going to do a little bit of a side. So the, so the problem with uncertainty is there's a lot of different aspects to it, and there's a lot of different definitions, and a lot of different people think about it in different ways. Um, and so rather than telling you what it is, I'm going to tell you what I'm treating it as for the purposes of this talk. <laughs> um, and so for the purposes of this talk, I'm largely adopting a Bayesian view of uncertainty, which put another way is sort of just saying uncertainty is probability. Um, so this is a oversimplification. Um, there's a lot of aspects to uncertainty that are not captured here. So there are, there are qualitative aspects to uncertainty that I'm mostly ignoring for the purposes of this talk. I would love, I'm quite happy to, to 
talk about them uh, if there are questions about it after. Uh, but for the purposes of this talk, I felt it was best to focus on something um, coherent. Okay, so if you're not familiar with a Bayesian approach to data analysis, I'm going to give you a really quick tour. Um, if you are familiar with it, I'm going to be simplifying things here, so don't get mad at me uh, for that. Um, so let's say that I was trying to do something like estimate the difference in speed at which people can complete some task on two different interfaces. Um, so I have interface A and B. Uh, I have a bunch of observations here. These observations are the uh, difference between performance on interface A and B. So each data point here represents one person, their difference in performance on the two interfaces. Um, what I want to do is estimate the mean performance here. So I want the, a probability distribution that describes what I think the mean difference between these uh, are given the data that I've observed. Um, I can't directly calculate that. I can do something like this, which is I can wander along this space and I can say, well, what's the chance I could have observed the data that I got given any particular hypothetical mean difference? So I'll pretend the mean difference is a little bit above negative four, and then I'll ask what's the chance I could have generated data that looks like this. Um, as I get closer to the sample mean, this chance goes up. So if I'm at the sample mean, the chance that I could generate data that looks sort of like this is highest and then drops off symmetrically on the other side. This is called the likelihood, um, which as you can see is the probability of the data given a mean difference, but what I wanted was the probability of the mean difference given the data. Uh, and what I need to do that, in order to get that, I need something called a prior, so I have to have some prior beliefs about what I think this mean difference might be. Um, oh, I should say, if I wanted to just stop there, that's going to give me the frequent confidence interval that you may be more familiar with if you're not familiar with Bayesian uh, analysis. But I might have some prior knowledge, so I might have seen these types of interfaces before. I might know that uh, differences between them are basically never greater than like four or six seconds. Uh, mm -hmm. So I could provide some prior information into this analysis and then essentially multiply these two curves together and that gets you your posterior, which is the probability of the mean difference given the data. That might give me something like this. Uh, you'll notice in this particular example, it's a little bit more conservative. Uh, conservative here meaning closer to zero. Uh, and essentially that's just because the prior makes me less excited about weird things that are out here. So if I happen to get a sample where the sample mean is way out here, it's going to be pulled in a little bit towards zero. Um, and that's also in proportion to how uncertain I would be about that. Okay. So this is not really what this talk is about. The reason I'm putting it up here is that the thing we want to get to is I need something like this as my representation of uncertainty, or at least that's what I'm going to use. Um, the other thing I might use, um, and the other reason why this is important, is I may use a large sample from this distribution as a way of describing or representing uncertainty. Um, and this is really helpful because this gives me something that I can use to show to people who are human. <laughs> because they will understand this kind of hypothetical uh, or, or frequency framing approach where I can give them samples from this distribution as a way of describing uncertainty. So as I said before, for the purposes of this talk, I'm largely adopting this view. It's helpful uh, for a number of reasons. Um, one of them in particular is because I can use that to communicate more effectively to people. So let's get back to that. Okay, so we have this idea of discrete outcome or frequency framing visualizations of uncertainty, uh, the icon arrays and the quantile dot plots as particular examples of that. Um, I wanted to revisit the 2016 election thing again just for a second uh, because yesterday uh, we spent some time picking on 538, so I thought I'd uh, throw my hat in the ring. Um, <laughs> so th this, this was their uh, midterm updated kind of uh, forecast visualization. Um, so they have done some things here that are nice. So they're actually using frequency framing now. So they're no longer giving you the, uh, you know, 78.9% chance of whoever will win the election. They're using these 
fractions with relatively small denominators, actually very small denominators. Uh, on the other hand, they are also kind of doing this thing, which is uh, probably implying some level of precision that's not really there. Uh, I think it would be kind of cool to see this as something more like a dot plot because you know, then you could get rid of the sort of over, over preciseness of this visualization and also actually make it easier for people to understand. Uh, so there's good and the bad, right? Um, some other discrete outcome uncertainty visualizations that I think are fun to talk about. Uh, so we're in Miami, so let's talk about hurricanes. Um, hurricane air cones. So lots of problems with hurricane air cones. Um, this is typically, I think, like a 66% um, confidence band around the predicted track. So two-thirds of the predictions are not even uh, drawn on this. Uh, you also have the problem of what's called a deterministic construal error. So uh, people will misinterpret, uh, usually about a third of people will misinterpret the uh, size of this as not being uncertainty in the location of the track, but as being a prediction of the size of the hurricane. Uh, which it is most certainly not. <laughs> Some ways to mitigate that, so this is a spaghetti plot of uh, predicted hurricane location. So this is getting into this idea of let's actually um, have a probability distribution that describes our uncertainty in the location of this thing and um, depict samples from it here where they are paths, possible paths. But there are problems with ensembles as well. So there's an interesting experiment that uh, Lace Padilla and uh, a handful of other people ran where they gave people stimuli like this and showed, so you have A and B marked here, um, and then asked them uh, which, which is more likely uh, to have the hurricane go through it, A or B. And the problem was that, uh, so here we have A and B, A should have lower density if you imagine a probability distribution here, so A should be less likely than B. Uh, here, B should be more likely than A, but A happens to lie on one of these spaghetti trails. And so people, well, some people will, be more, will think that A is more likely than B. So this is that kind of deterministic construal error. So deterministic construal error is when you misinterpret a uh, representation of uncertainty as being some kind of representation of something deterministic. So that comes up, as I said before, in error cones. So misinterpreting size here as conveying real physical size instead of uh, location. Um, misinterpreting these spaghetti trails here as indicating um, actual paths and where there is no trail, there's no path. Uh, the classic example of this actually comes from uh, Susan Jocelyn, who's a psychologist who studies reasoning in, uh, uh, under uncertainty in weather forecasts. Uh, so she studies presentations like this. So this is the predicted uh, high temperature on a particular day with a confidence interval from uh, 38 to 44 degrees. About a third of people will misinterpret the 44 degrees there as the predicted high and the 38 as the predicted low. Right, as opposed to being the uncertainty in uh, that one number, the 41. Um, so let's talk about some ways of uh, maybe trying to mitigate these sorts of things. So um, this is a, uh, a typical way you might convey the uncertainty in a regression fit, so 95% confidence band. Um, this is a spaghetti plot, so similar sort of thing that we've just been talking about with hurricanes. Um, but there's something else you can do, which is rather than uh, just giving you this static plot, I can give you something uh, like this, a, uh, what uh, Jessica Hallman kind of introduced this idea called hypothetical outcome plots with the cute name of hops, right, because they're hopping around. Um, <laughs> the idea is now it's very difficult, or at least much more difficult for you to ignore the uncertainty here than it is here, and especially in compared to this, right? So over here, I'll just take this line and ignore the band. Um, here, I'm reasonably good at uh, estimating averages from uh, visual ensembles, so I can still kind of find the average line here. But over here, it's a lot harder because it's hopping around. 
I don't have evidence for this, but I suspect that these sorts of displays may also uh, aid uh, or mitigate deterministic construal errors in situations like this. So you can imagine these kind of uh, animated approaches to um, hurricane uncertainty visualization where now you, you don't have this kind of fixed situation where I'll have one path overlapping a point and the other one not because I'm giving you these sort of running draws from this prediction. You can also do this sort of thing for uh, time slices. So rather than doing, say, a bunch of uh, confidence uh, bands around a particular location, I might give you something like this. Uh, this is kind of neat, too, because uh, now you can encode things, additional information. It may be kind of hard to see here, but the, uh, the um, hurricane strength is also encoded as a number on these dots. Obviously, you could imagine perhaps more effective encodings and using numbers for that. But now you can actually start to see um, more than one variable at the same time. Uh, right, so I also said I'm going to give a bit of a tour through some things that have been showing up in the media. So let's talk about animated uncertainty visualization showing up in the media. Um, there is this really nice uh, sort of thing this was back in 2014, the New York Times did, um, how not to be misled by the jobs report. Uh, so the idea here was you're trying to figure out if the growth pattern of a given jobs report looks like this or looks like this. Um, and so what I'll do is I will show you a bunch of different um, hops, essentially, of possible jobs reports that could be generated if the real trend was this or if the real trend was that. And now you can try to judge uh, which of these is more likely given the report that I, that I see now. The interesting thing is we actually did, we did a study on this, um, and it turns out that it actually works. So in comparison to doing something like showing you a confidence interval, you're much better at judging the uncertainty in this sort of animated presentation if you're trying to decide if there was growth or no growth in a jobs report. Another really nice example that I think uh, combines essentially icon arrays and animation. Um, I think I need to reload this. So if you haven't seen this, this was a nice uh, piece from The Guardian. Um, the idea here is each of these clusters represents a different vaccination rate for measles. Um, the red are people who are infected, the blue are people who were vaccinated, and the yellow are people who were not vaccinated. Um, and then it's just running a simulation uh, to see if a group of people at that particular vaccination rate um, end up being susceptible to an outbreak. The other thing that's really nice here from a kind of storytelling perspective is they annotate a bunch of counties uh, that have those vaccination rates. So there's some counties in Washington, for example, that are way down here at 58% that are certainly not uh, protected from a measles outbreak. And I think one of the things that's going on here is that animation actually helps people experience uncertainty um, in a way that is sometimes fairly difficult from a static presentation. Um, and I think that this can be very powerful. So, so an, a, another uh, sort of more recent example um, that I imagine a number of you have seen was this example. Uh, which I'll just let run for a second. So I, I think the, the power of this really is this blue wave that you can see. Um, and I, I think that, um, 
I, yeah, I, I, I don't think I really need to comment much more on this. I think it, it is um, a very powerful uh, presentation of this sort of information. Okay, so another thing that came up a lot yesterday was maps. So let's talk about cartographic uncertainty because it is a pain. Um, <laughs> so cartographic uncertainty, let's just map uh, uncertainty to another visual channel, right? That'll work. I have no idea how to interpret this map. Um, let's try again. Like somehow this is worse. Um, so, <laughs> it's very abstract. Um, I mean, one of the things we, we talk about in uncertainty visualization is these, uh, this kind of difference between intrinsic and extrinsic representations of uncertainty. Um, and I, I feel that a, a lot of the work in uncertainty visualization is trying to find uncertainty representations that feel more intuitive or are somehow more intrinsic to the way that it is rep represented, and don't just amount to let's map uncertainty to another channel. Um, and that's the difficulty of uncertainty visualization because one, often you start, uh, well really you just start running out of ways of doing that. Um, and the more other visual channels that are already used up, the harder it becomes to find an interesting and effective way to do an intrinsic uncertainty visualization. Uh, so some ideas are using things like uh, blur, which kind of feels more intuitive. Um, there's some evidence that we're not actually very good at uh, perceptually estimating blur. So um, if I ask you to like quantify how much blurrier that is than that compared to that, you're probably not very good at it. Um, <laughs> so I'm not a GIS person, but I'm, so I'm gonna take a little detour to something else that isn't maps and then we'll come back to maps and I'll show you how it's related. Um, so this is a uh, uh, scatterplot matrix, right? Um, so I've got eight variables here. Um, I've only shown you the lower triangle of the scatterplot matrix because you don't need the upper half of it, right? Um, so a typical way of displaying, or not uncertainty, just correlation here would be like a correlation heat map, right? Uh, so here I'm showing things like I've just mapped correlation uh, onto this color scale between negative one and positive one, and then this has a positive correlation, so it's fairly blue, and that has a negative correlation, so it's fairly red. These are all kind of not strongly correlated with each other, uh, with the exception of kind of these ones down here. Um, the problem is that I can't really, well, there is no uncertainty being communicated here, right? Um, and if I think about the analogy between this and a map, like the, these, this could be a map and these could be counties or something like that, right? Um, so let's try to shove uncertainty into this thing. Um, so I was playing around with this on Twitter the other day because uh, uh, some, someone had asked some question about uh, correlation matrices. Um, I'm actually gonna zoom in and just do the top three and then we'll try to see how we can get something to scale. So we'll take these three and we'll try to do something better than a heat map. Um, the first thing that I tried was something like this, which is not great. Um, so basically this is just, I've uh, got some estimates of the correlation with uncertainty. Um, again, I'm describing them as probability distributions, they, or I'm describing my uncertainty as probability distributions, and I've got negative one over here, positive one over there. Uh, it doesn't really work very well. Um, part of the problem is that I'm, I'm not kind of using any un intuitive mappings of correlation. Um, I could do something more like this. So here, uh, I've tweaked it a little bit by at least making up be positive correlation and down be negative correlation. And then I've uh, mapped color onto each part of this gradient according to that same correlation color scale as before, right? Um, so this is getting a little bit better, I think, because I, I mean, now I can see the uncertainty. It's, I, I think it's a lot easier to understand. I can kind of map this to this. The color is there so that I can get the high level gist, right? So that I can maybe go back to this and still pick out these and those. Um, I still kind of think it's not quite there yet. I mean, it, it's, it's still kind of abstract. It'd be hard to explain to people. Um, let's try something a little bit weirder. Um, so what I'm gonna do in each of these cells 
is I'm going to take a bunch of draws from this distribution, one for every pixel in this cell, and then I'm going to color those pixels according to those draws. Uh, so this is uh, essentially using dithering to communicate uncertainty. The nice thing about human perception is you can still look at the square and see what the average color is. Um, but at the same time, how dithered a square is is communicating the uncertainty. In this particular example, it's not that interesting because the uncertainty is essentially the same in all of these squares. So they're all about the same level of dither. Um, we go back to a map example. Uh, so here's an example of exactly that technique applied to poverty rates. Um, and there's some interesting things I think you can see here. So if you look at Kansas City, um, there isn't a lot of uncertainty in that county, which probably makes sense because the population is probably much higher than most of the other counties. The other thing that's nice is that you can pick out other counties that are similar to Kansas City on the basis of their average um, poverty rate, but which you know have more uncertainty because you can see that the dither is higher. Um, I, I don't know for certain. I mean, I think there's probably some other perceptual tasks here that you could, you could kind of do. So you could probably find uh, counties that are uh, almost certainly have higher poverty rate than Kansas City just by having essentially no pixels that are around the same value as Kansas City. That all, if all the pixels are above Kansas City, then um, it's fairly certain that that county is also above Kansas City. Um, so I think there's some interesting things kind of going on here uh, that could work well. There are still some issues. So deterministic construal errors would probably come back to bite you, at least in map land, um, because people may misinterpret this as actually communicating the value at any given pixel location, because pixel locations are meaningful here. In the correlation context, they aren't, right? Um, but I think this is, this is an interesting direction to push. I mean, you could imagine an animated version of this where uh, the pixels are kind of flickering so that you wouldn't be able to make that deterministic construal error, and then uh, maybe this would actually work. So I think this is kind of exciting and interesting. Um, another kind of idea that uh, actually a researcher at, at Tableau, uh, Michael Carell, um, has played around with is, uh, this idea of value suppressing uncertainty palettes. So this is kind of interesting. So the idea here is that um, the more uncertainty that you have in some estimate, the more you uh, kind of uh, pull that estimate towards the uh, mean um, in the color palette that you set. So this is uncertainty, more uncertainty down here. And then this is a uh, margin of predicted lead um, or sorry, just predicted lead, right? So where we don't have a lot of certainty about the estimates, they essentially get pulled towards gray, which I think is kind of interesting. Um, this is, to my mind, essentially an attempt to deal with uh, perceptual issues with probability. Um, so uh, there's this really interesting model called the linear log odds uh, model for perception of proportions. Uh, it, the, we have a tendency to have this kind of S shape to our uh, perception of proportions. So the uh, X axis here is the true proportion and the Y axis is the perceived proportion. This is a nice review article that just essentially takes a bunch of uh, studies and says, oh, it turns out they all more or less have this shape um, with a relatively simple parameterization. Um, it turns out if you take the log odds of both of these numbers, uh, the relationship between true pr proportions and perceived proportions is usually linear. Um, this is also kind of cool because uh, this same functional shape turns out to be the functional shape of prospect theory. Um, it's also the functional shape of um, this uh, interesting uh, perceptual model for how people perceive proportions in things like bar charts and pie charts. Uh, called the cyclical power model. So if you're familiar with Stevens' power law, it's basically an extension of that. Um, so it kind of unifies all of these different um, ideas to give us an explanation, or well, not an explanation, but a model that describes the way in which people um, have biases when they perceive proportions, um, which gives us potentially ways of correcting for it. Um, you could imagine trying to actually correct for this bias in the way that you present proportions. 
I think that's a little bit more of a controversial idea. I'd be happy to talk about it. I, do, I don't know of any work that's actually tried to do it. It would be fun to, to play around with, though. Um, ah, that part's not interesting. So going back to the election data, just to sort of finish up, because that seems to be the way to finish up. Um, this is, of course, the New York Times election needle. I, what I really wanted to have on this slide was the New York Times election needle for the midterm. Uh, so I had this whole plan where I was going to sit and like record the entire thing over the midterm, and then they turned the jitter off. So uh, I have to use the old version because I like the jitter. <laughs> People don't like the jitter. So, so my my favorite one of these. Uh, Stand down here in the right-hand corner. Um, the New York Times needle jitter is irresponsible design at best and unethical design at worst, and you should stop looking at it. Um, I completely disagree with this. I was actually really sad that they got rid of the jitter. Um, the jitter is essentially hops, right? And it is forcing people to confront their uncertainty in, uh, in these predictions. Um, and so people got angry, and they got anxious, and they got frustrated. Um, but I think they got angry, and they got anxious, and they got frustrated because they should have been. Um, if you're uncertain about something that you care about, you should be anxious. And so that actually kind of just brings me to the end of my talk, which is that I think that what we need to do in uncertainty visualization is present well-calibrated uncertainty that can't be ignored in ways that people can actually understand. Thank you.